One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, ah, nineteen ninety four, ah, seven years old, thinking I was gonna grow up to marry one of the Spice Girls and drive a red Ferrari. Looks like I was a bit off with that prediction. I drive a 1998 Honda, and our dog eats her own poop. Way to go, buddy! Welcome to another. <clears throat> Sorry, I've、uh, caught a bit of a cold over here. I typically get what you would call a man cold, meaning I am、uh, on the verge of dying. I'm just barely able to hold on to my my vocal cords right now. Anyway, as I was saying, welcome to another video, and this time we are making two coffee tables from some very beautiful looking ash cookie and grain slabs. And as you can see, there is the challenge of putting these back together, because one of them was in two pieces and the other was in three. This is typical of cookies; they develop a large crack from the pith as they dry. The crack typically travels the shortest distance from the pith to the outside of the slab. But these are for a client who had this tree taken down on his own property, and two cookies were milled from the stump. So after getting all the pieces flattened, I then remove the bark using a thick piece of steel and a mallet. I do this to try and knock it off rather than cutting it off with a chisel. Doing it this way usually leaves the most natural texture on the live edge, which is what I was hoping to achieve. But continuing on here, you can see I eventually had to resort to using chisels to remove some stubborn areas of bark. And since that was taking forever. I instead grabbed the angle grinder using an 80 grit flat disc to remove what was left of the bark and the, the inner bark. So milling end grain with a surfacing bit will sometimes leave these tear outs,、um, no matter how careful you are, and these do take a bit of sanding to get rid of, as I'm sure most of you are aware. End grain is notoriously hard to sand, and the Rotex does work fairly well、uh, as long as you keep the sandpaper fresh and change as soon as it gets dull. And here I'm using 40 grit paper to remove all the milling marks. Before joining the pieces back together, I wanted to smooth out the insides of all the cracks. These areas would not be accessible to me once they were glued up. And no, we are not gonna fill these with epoxy. The client didn't want any plastic in his table, and I have really grown to dislike working with epoxy. So I'm gonna take any opportunity I can to avoid using it. A bit more rough sanding and shaping, and we are ready to join the pieces together. I decided on using dominoes as floating tenons, which are glued, and then the idea was to put bow ties on top of the dominoes to make them a little bit less visible and also add a a nice decorative touch. Some people don't like them.、Uh, I'm somewhere in between. If it makes sense, I think they serve a purpose, and then I think they should be used. And they are actually surprisingly strong too. So bow ties, yeah. If it makes sense, use them. So this will hold all the pieces in check, and this will make the entire tabletop somewhat solid. But we need to pick a design for the table base that will make the entire piece really, really solid, which you will see a little bit later here. But for now, thanks to these dominoes, both of these tabletops are now a single piece. You might notice we have fast forwarded a couple of months. I began this project late summer last year, and we are now in winter. So what happened? Well, nothing really. It had to be put on hold for a couple of months. So this was filmed a couple of weeks ago, and here I'm just picking it up where I left. However, 
During the time I, I had this project on hold, I had acquired this machine, and I will talk briefly about it, as it has proven to be a very effective sander for large and odd-shaped pieces, and I needed something with lots of power to do rough sanding for removing milling or planing marks. I needed the machine to be able to handle pieces that are too wide or just irregularly shaped, things like that, that would not fit into my wide belt sander. Still, I use handheld sanders to achieve a good finish, but this works amazing for rough sanding and it has a ton of power, so I can go straight to a 120 grit belt and it will remove any milling marks super quick. You actually need to be a bit light handed even with 120 grit. If you stay too long on a small area or push too hard, it will dig into the wood and leave a low spot. So you gotta keep the table moving side to side at all time and then feeding the pressure pad forward using just light pressure. This does leave a fairly decent finish right off the machine and it saves a ton of time not having to work through the grits as much when rough sanding using a handheld sander. I like to get about 90% of all the sanding done before I do any inlay work and here I inlay ash bow ties. I'm using a small trim router and a up spiral bit. Here is a good close up of what I'm seeing when I do these. I try and get as close to my knife line as I possibly can with the router bit. I generally do two or three passes depending on how thick the bow ties are. If you try and take out all the wood in one pass, there is a risk of the router bit catching or it will make handling the router more difficult. The remaining waste can be easily chiseled out and the knife line makes it very easy to perfectly align the chisel edge with the outline of the bow tie. I must have made well over a hundred of these by now and once you get a little bit proficient at this, they can be made fairly quickly. I think I made these 12 in an hour or hour and a half maybe. Okay, moving forward, I then drill eight holes on the bottom of each tabletop. These holes will receive threaded inserts, which is what I typically use to mount table bases to slab furniture. A little trick I do is to use just a basic tap for metal working. And although the pitch of the threads on the tap do not match the pitch of the threaded inserts, I find that tapping all the holes prior to installing the inserts does prevent the insert from causing a split in the wood which can sometimes happen when the coarse thread of the insert cuts its way into a hardwood like oak or ash. Then I do the final sanding using this Merca sander. And I think this sander is meant for sanding drywall. It does a horrible job of actual wood removal. Say if you needed to remove any dings or scratches, using this machine would probably take forever. But since we already have a pretty nice 120 grit finish on here, I can use this. It has a large 225 millimeter diameter pad and taking it up to 180 grit finish goes pretty quick. And the strength of this machine is that it does leave an absolutely flawless finish. The sheen it creates is incredibly uniform. And I find that is one of the most difficult things to achieve with small sanders is to have a, a uniform sheen, especially on large surfaces. And since I make so many tables, using this as a finish sander on large surfaces works really well for me. I made a simple table base also using some nice straight grained ash. It's just a very simple four legged design with a slight taper on all of the legs and the legs are splayed just a few degrees. The dominoes and bow ties are not meant to support the weight of each cracked piece. They are mainly for holding everything together. The table base is what gives proper support. Now it's finally time to put some finish on these. 
I use just regular Osmo. It says 3032 on the label, which is a satin sheen with no pigments, just, you know, very basic hard wax oil. And I apply it using a white scotch bright and then wipe it dry with a cotton rag. The beginning of the end of the Wild West. I often think I would have made a pretty decent cowboy. I always wanted to ride a horse on a lonely trail, riding into the sunset on a late summer's eve. Nothing but a couple of cows and a lonely whisper of the wind to keep me company. <sighs> Who am I kidding? The horse would probably just kick me off and I get run over by a herd of spooked buffaloes. Psst, a cowboy. I can't even shoot a gun. And what do I know about horses anyway? So, 1886. Which one was it? Uh, no, that's not the one. Uh, don't worry, we can figure this out. No, oh, you idiot, you lost a growth ring, didn't you? We were so close to counting every single one and you lost a growth ring. You worthless piece of human waste. Hmm. Now go back and do the whole thing over again. Okay, so let's find out how old this tree really was. And yes, I was eventually able to count all the rings. So if you guessed it to be 150 years old, well then you would be wrong, my friend. This was 189 years old. It was cut down in 2018, which means that the first growth ring would be dated to the year 1829. So yeah, a lot of history in these tables. Hope you liked the video and thank you for watching and I hope to see you on the next one as well. 1987, <laughs> my birth year. I should probably thank my parents for that. Thanks mom for giving birth to me. And thanks dad for making her pregnant. Ugh. Erase, erase. Oh crap, it's too late. <laughs>